Hey everyone, welcome to Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. I am Heather Hoops Matthews with NP Strategy here in the studio with Matthew Roberts, a Nexon Pruitt healthcare attorney. Matthew, good to be with you. Good to see you. Matthew, uh, there were a lot of learnings with the pandemic. One of them I've seen over the course of all of our video podcasts has just been the rise in understanding of the importance of public health and a state's epidemiologist. Yes. And so public health is crucially important. We learned that maybe the hard way during COVID, and we on this podcast have been promoting that. And the, the face of public health for the state is, a, in, in some respects, is the state's epidemiologist. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's important for people to know that, who that state's epidemiologist is and what they do and how important it is to the state. Mm-hmm. Well, we're fortunate today. Joining us is North Carolina's epidemiologist, Dr. Zach Moore. He is uh, with their North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and he is the chief of the epidemiology section there which is really in his role at the forefront, as Matthew may have said, um, with keeping the public informed about what's going on with public health. Of course, during the pandemic, we're really ongoing now with the flu and anything else. So Dr. Moore, thank you so much for joining us today. Sure, thank you for having me. As we get started, would you tell us a little bit about um, what you're seeing in North Carolina right now regarding the pandemic uh, with COVID any cases? Are people getting the booster shots? Just give us your assessment. Well, it's still here. (laughs) Um, I think everyone wishes it was not, but we still are having, um, you know, COVID cases and unfortunately COVID deaths occurring in North Carolina, like everywhere else. Um, It's a different situation now. Obviously, we're in a situation where every single person has some level of immunity to COVID, either through vaccination or through infection, or in many cases, both. So the um, the way that it's showing up is different. The people who are more likely to experience severe illness or die from COVID now, even more than before, tend to be those, uh, you know, who are older individuals or individuals who are um, at high risk because of other medical conditions. Um, but uh, but lots of folks are still getting it. And unfortunately, um, we are still seeing that translate into long COVID or, you know, health issues that can go on for quite a while for some people. So still a very serious concern. Uh, we are seeing uptake with the new updated boosters. Um, not as much as we would like. Uh, as of uh, our last update, we had of the people who finished their primary series um, 17% had had that updated booster in North Carolina. So lots of room for improvement. It's a little bit of a higher number when you look at our 65 and over population, which is still the group at highest risk, as I just said. But even there, it's uh, only about a third of people have gotten that updated booster so far. So that's definitely something that we're um, we're still encouraging uh, encouraging people to do to protect themselves. Yeah, it's still with us, there's no doubt, and in some respects it's going to be with us, I guess, for the foreseeable future, uh, and we're continuing to find ways to cope and maintain. So um, uh, another topic is that we're reading about pediatric providers uh, identifying large numbers of respiratory cases, illnesses in, in, in children in North Carolina and South Carolina in the Southeast. Um, and I think North Carolina just recently, sadly, reported their first uh pediatric flu death this season. Can you talk a little bit about some of these pediatric respiratory conditions and what, you know, tell yeah, us what I we mean, should know. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, for the first couple of years, it was really all COVID. I mean, it was horrible and the numbers of deaths are, uh, you know, clearly historic and, and tragic, but it was all COVID. We didn't really have much flu. We didn't have much RSV, which is one of the respiratory infections that's particularly serious for young kids. Um, they were just kind of absent, whether that, you know, whether that was because of the um, restrictions and masking and prevention measures that were in place for COVID or whether it was, uh, you know, something that we don't really understand in terms of how viruses compete for real estate in our noses and throats. You know, there's, you know, we don't, we don't really know that, but for whatever reason that they were kind of absent. And so that's really what's different now. We still have COVID, but not just COVID. We have um, all the other respiratory viruses and they're all out of whack. Um, you know, 
their seasonal respiratory viruses. They're supposed to happen in a seasonal pattern. They always have, but not uh, not so much right now. Um, so we, we saw RSV in particular, um, even a year ago, we saw RSV in the summer when we're not really supposed to see it. Um, and so we had to you know, make some changes, particularly for the premature babies who were at the highest risk to make sure that they had access to the, uh, the medication they need to prevent RSV infection during a season when we normally wouldn't be doing that. Um, and then again, this RSV came super early and we started seeing increases. And uh, fortunately here in the North Carolina and the Southeast, that looks like it has peaked at least for now and starting to come down. But RSVs, um, you know, we had, it's, it's totally the wrong time for us to be um, seeing this much RSV. Um, it, usually, you know, sometimes we get a spike around Christmas or New Year's, but this was much earlier and much more RSV than, than we'd seen certainly in a long while. So that's a big deal for our, for babies and for families, but also for um, hospitals. Uh, many hospitals had taken some of their pediatric ICU space and shifted that to adults because that's what was needed during COVID. So that, you know, made it more difficult to accommodate all the sick kids. And then, of course, you got the staffing issues and everybody knows about all the challenges with healthcare, uh, all the high vacancy rates in our nurses and other healthcare providers. So there's a lot of reasons why it was challenging. Um, with RSV and then flu. We also have um, a fair amount of flu. You mentioned, unfortunately, we um, had one pediatric flu death that um, occurred uh, a few weeks ago now. We've had um, uh, almost 40 uh, flu deaths that have been reported this season already. And again, you know, we're not seeing record-breaking flu activity, but we're seeing it at a time that is not when it should be. So it kind of, you know, makes me a little worried. It feels like with all this, we should be ready for spring now, but we're not really in winter yet. So, uh, you know, RSV is coming down. We hope flu will come down, but we got a long ways to go. So it makes me a little concerned for, are we going to start, you know, seeing second peaks of some of these things that um, visited us earlier than expected. Speaking of RSV, what can parents do to help their children from getting it? Is there anything they can do? And then if they get it, what should they do? Well, um, so for, for most people, it's really just kind of the um, common sense prevention measures that, that we recommend. There's not yet a vaccine that's, um, that's available to prevent RSV, um, although that is being worked on. But it's really just, you know, if you're, if you're sick, staying home, if your kids are sick, keeping them out of school so they're not spreading it to others, um, you know, teaching kids about good hand washing and respiratory etiquette, you know, covering coughs and sneezes, doing those kind of basic things. Uh, I mentioned premature babies and very young infants. That's the group at highest risk. And there is actually a medication that those babies um, can get during normally RSV season, but now, you know, during you know, when, it, when we're seeing this much RSV, the, those babies, um, you know, doctors hopefully have them plugged in. There's a injection they can get once a month that um, is very helpful for preventing severe illness and death in that most vulnerable group. Dr. Moore, the U.S. reported over 20,000 cases of MPOX, I think formerly known as monkeypox, and that peaked in early August of this year. Um, that was a pretty high uh, or a pretty impressive spike. And then how did that happen so fast? And then has it gone away as quickly as it, as it came about? Uh, thankfully, it really has. Um, fortunately, you know, we'll see what the future holds. But um, it's a that that's been a very interesting um, outbreak to to watch and to deal with. Um, and just to step back a little bit, monkeypox or mpox now, excuse me, had actually been increasing um, for several years. And it, it's a virus that's closely related to smallpox. And since smallpox was eradicated, people aren't getting vaccinated anymore against smallpox. And so that immunity in the population had gone down. And so we had seen mpox cases, cases start to rise in the parts of Africa where it's endemic. And then, um, you know, what happened here is that mpox got into a, a different population, particularly into uh, the population of, of men who have sex with men, which is where most of the transmission was occurring. 
And it was a while before that was sort of detected. So by the time we as a, you know, worldwide recognized this, uh, it had already really spread pretty far and wide. Um, so that's, I think, why, you know, we saw the the fairly rapid increase in cases. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, with MPOX, there is a vaccine um, that was available through the strategic national stockpile. So through our public health system, um, we were able to, to start vaccinating folks. And if you will, feels like a long time ago now, you recall there was a not as much of that vaccine as we would have wanted. Um, so, you know, we had to be pretty focused in who was eligible, but we've been able to expand that out. And I think that's that's helped a lot. I mean, here in North Carolina, we vaccinated more than 14,000 people um, to protect them against monkeypox who meet those eligibility criteria. So that's been helpful, but also it's been um, a lot of just working with the communities who are being disproportionately impacted to try to get the messages out um, about vaccine, but also just about general prevention. And um, I think that's that's helped a lot in terms of um, controlling the spread, but it's still there. We are still seeing cases. And I think, um, you know, it's going to be something that we're going to have to continue, um, continue working on and not, not sort of forget about it and risk having it come back when, you know, if people aren't getting the vaccine or aren't taking those prevention measures they need to. Over the course of the last, I guess, two years, we've been doing this now to this podcast, we have heard people talk about it's important to plan and uh, have enough public health dollars, you know, forward looking. And so uh, if we could talk a little bit about there are also environmental issues impacting public health. And I suspect that is something that you also plan and, you know, look forward on. Uh, what would be some issues in North Carolina? Would it be something like climate change or or would there be other things? Well, and if I could just step back for a second and get on my soapbox and because you, you raised public health funding and what's happened during the pandemic. And, you know, the sad reality is that funding for our public health is very what we call siloed you know you don't get money to uh you be ready to prevent the next thing you get money for the last thing and you can only use it for that thing and so it really makes it hard to be flexible and prepared for for things that are are yet to come so that's a challenge that certainly um hurt us in our covid response and sadly uh does not appear to be a lesson that's been learned in terms of the um, you know, the response to monkeypox and the response to other issues that come up. But yeah, environmental issues um, are a major health concern. Um, climate change has a lot of impacts in North Carolina, as it does everywhere else, uh, and particularly in terms of more severe weather events, whether that's hurricanes, flooding, um, extreme heat, etc. And so those are issues that, you know, we're trying to build resiliency and you know there are things that affect us all but there are, are always certain groups that are disproportionately affected by those impacts um so trying to work with those communities who may not have you know take the heat uh example may not have air conditioning may not you know may work in places where they're either outside doing farm work or other types of agricultural work or they're in factories that don't have air conditioning etc so there's there's specific groups that we try to work with to um, prepare that, you know, help build resiliency. And then with flooding and hurricanes, you know, we have a lot of people who are still on septic systems and, and wells in North Carolina. Um, and so, you know, those, those folks may be more vulnerable when, when some of these things happen. Um, so trying to, trying to work with, with certain groups in our, in our state that we know are, at higher risk for some of the bad, um, bad outcomes that, that we're seeing with climate change. That's a big focus that our governor has taken on and, you know, trying to look across the whole state, uh, all the state agencies to see how we can work together on that. But then we also have, unfortunately, um, all the other environmental health concerns we in North Carolina have been dealing with, um, PFAS, which is those per and polyfluoroalkyl substances that people call the forever chemicals um, that, you know, 
have been a major uh, national and global issue in North Carolina. Um, there was a big contamination, uh, you know, awareness about contamination from a, a PFAS manufacturing plant in the state. And that's continued to be um, something that we're trying to um, to work on, help, uh, you know, help reduce the contamination, help people understand their health risks, et cetera. So there's um, there's a lot of a lot of environmental concerns and, and health issues that uh, that public health um, tries to tries to deal with. Uh, we know that the COVID-19 uh, crisis put a huge spotlight on the public health profession. And I think personally that public health leaders stepped up to the plate in an incredibly difficult uh, situation. And then things got political and the media uh, skewed things as they do. Um, Post-COVID, how has the public health profession changed in your opinion? And, and how, what changes do you anticipate seeing in the future? Uh, it's a very interesting time to be in public health, for sure. Um, you know, I think we, we, we've got our challenges. Um, you know, if you, there's been recent reports put out about um, stress and PTSD type uh, yep. issues in the public health workforce related to the pandemic response. Um, and that's real and something that we need to deal with. Um, but, but there also have been a lot of people who've gotten interested in or aware of public health during this time. I think it's always a little surprising to those of us who <laughs> kind of live through this response, that that would be something that people would run towards. But in fact, they do. And we've seen a lot of interest from from younger people and students in in these areas, which is great. And hopefully that will um, help us to, you know, to build out our our public health workforce. But we're also, you know, back to my sort of soapbox on siloed funding. We did get a lot of funds to help deal with the COVID pandemic, but it was all short term Fun. Right, so right. all the sort of the challenge right now is how do we hold on to the sort of best practices that were built so that we can have those in place for the next thing um, without any of that funding continue. So so it's, um, you know, it's it's an interesting time. And um, in many ways, I think there's sort of exciting uh, changes in the field of public health, but some of those familiar challenges in terms of trying to uh, be creative with with how we can use what we have to um be prepared for for the next big thing. Do you feel like you've been given a, an, a a better opportunity to convey the importance of public health uh, using COVID as an example now, so well, people recognize? I mean, sadly, hey. you mentioned the politicization. So I think for half the country, yes, <laughs> they yeah. saw the value of public health, and half the country, I think, probably left the pandemic more less favorably disposed towards public health than they came into it. Um, so I think it's it's a mixed bag and that's, um, you know, that's a challenge. But I do think there is more awareness. I thought we were maybe getting to a point where I could tell people I'm an epidemiologist and they would know what that was, but uh, not not so no. much. No, <laughs> they still not if we have anything yes. to do with it. We'll work on we'll that. work on that. <laughs> uh, one other kind of, I guess it's a, a challenge that came out of that pandemic is is just the how tricky it can be to communicate with people. You referenced sort of divide in our country. Some of it, it seems to have been generated just with words yeah. during the pandemic. Uh, what are some lessons learned or, or that you think uh, lessons learned during that? Uh, don't have a pandemic during an election year, I think would be a good lesson <laughs> yes. for me. So if we can plan that better <laughs> next time, that would be helpful. Um, no, I think I, there, there's a lot of lessons learned in terms of our our communications, and that's one area where I think we've 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 come a long way in in terms of engaging with different communities and um, you know forming new partnerships and sort of getting outside of the walls of governmental public health and right. um, you know that's all, we've always worked in partnerships, um, but I think that we took a lot of leaps forward in that way during the COVID response. So that'll be really one of the things that, um, that we need to work hard to hold on to, even as all the, all the funding goes away, um, keep those partnerships, partnerships up because it's never just about what you're saying, you know, it's always about the message and the messenger. And right. so, you know, working with the communities, having those trusted messengers, and that's not going to be me for a lot of places or some government person. Um, so I think that's a really, um, it, it wasn't a new 
thing that we learned during COVID, but it was certainly, uh, you know, something that was highlighted and in, in, in an area where I think a lot of progress was made. Well, we've seen and heard in our healthcare practice and life sciences practice an uh, increased interest in younger people in public health. And I, I, I think that's a positive sign. I, I hope that the public health agencies will continue to reach out, go to schools, talk about what it is that you do, whether it's a clinical thing or this administrative thing. Um, it's important and people need to know it exists and see that what happened when it actually was used when it really mattered. Mm-hmm. I agree. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's encouraging and we're, we're trying to work to build that pipeline and, you know, increase awareness and particularly try to increase the diversity of our public health workforce. So there's a lot of exciting things happening um, that, you know, make me hopeful that, that there will be some, some positive impacts that come out of all this. Well, we're thankful for you and the role in your team in North Carolina for the role that you're playing in public health. So thank you for that. Um, Also, just on behalf of our video podcast, thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us and talk about North Carolina. We have offices in North Carolina, colleagues in North Carolina, and, and so it's great to have the perspective from you. We hope you'll come back at some point. We can chat in the future. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. I appreciate you all having me on. Yes, thank you. Matthew, RSV earlier. Yes. So yeah. I didn't realize that, but you know, now that I think about it, friends of mine who have kids have oh, been yeah. saying their kids had RSV. Oh yeah, it's been a big deal. You know, it's scary okay. since it's not the time. It's, not it's the time. Not more Something else yeah. that we're going to learn. Well, for those of you who joined us today, we hope you enjoyed our conversation. Uh, if you have ideas for our video podcast, shoot them our way. We always like to hear back from our viewers and listeners. And on behalf of Matthew and the whole Taking the Pulse team, thank you for joining us. We hope you're well, and we look forward to seeing you next time right here on Taking the Pulse, a healthcare and life sciences podcast. 